Special thanks to Savers for sponsoring our 125,000 subscriber lightsaber giveaway. If you want to find out how you can win one of six lightsabers, check the pinned comment down below. Hello. Our story begins on the Tanta IV, leaving Polis Massa. Two Jedi Masters and the Senator from Alderaan sat with two children, born from Padme and Anakin. There remained a troublesome question of what was to become of their fate. Would they be separated, or would they be trained from birth? So many options, and initially, Yoda suggested that the twins be pulled apart and sent to separate locations across the galaxy. Obi-Wan saw this mindset, but he also believed that it'd be foolish to do that. As Jedi, they understood that it was very possible for infants to remember moments from their past. This could be from as early as birth. If they separate the children now, then they could become resentful of the Jedi and turn on them. Obi-Wan didn't think the Empire would find them because Sidious would know that Padme was dead. If he knew that she was pregnant, then he could assume that the children died with her. Being that the Jedi never picked up on it, how likely would it be that Palpatine would know? On top of that, if the Jedi planned on sending one of the children to an Outer Rim world, then it would make more sense to keep them together. Bale thought this would be a good idea, being that he, nor Brea, wanted children at the moment. Yoda rubbed his chin and asked why Obi-Wan wanted them to be together, and he thought it'd make more sense. If they weren't trained from birth, then the chances of them discovering their Force sensitivity without intervention was much more likely. Plus, Anakin struggled from being an only child, so why not give them someone like them to confide in? Yoda saw reason with this. His mind was truthfully more clouded because he lost his fight with Sidious. His decision making for the last hundred years had been questionable, but in the last 72 hours, it was seemingly incredibly flawed. Obi-Wan noted this, which is why he was quick to counter the notion of the twins being split up. Before they were dropped off on Tatooine, Yoda gave Obi-Wan his instructions for communicating with the dead. It was something he never expected to come from Yoda, but he listened. The twins were taken to Owen and Beru so they could grow up with some semblance of normalcy. Obi-Wan in the days after his arrival on Tatooine would bury his and Anakin's lightsabers in the desert. He would also have a talk with Owen and Beru about the eventual training of Leia and Luke. The new parents were content with this, suggesting that when they were old enough it would certainly be something that could be done. This gave Obi-Wan a sense of optimism regarding the future training of the twins and how that could go. Little did he realize that Owen had no intention of making that a reality. Obi-Wan would return to his little cave, one not far from Owen and Broom, a place where he could keep his eye on them and protect them if need be. Kenobi would look for work where he could find it and try to fit in, try and forget about the path of the Jedi. He kept to his training, but there was no escape from his nightmares, from the thoughts that plagued him more than anything. He couldn't let go, he couldn't abandon Anakin. The war, the plague of the Sith, the rising darkness, it never ended. Every night was another waking nightmare, every day was a repeat of what came before. There was no normalcy, only chaos in the mind of a former Jedi Master. The first few weeks were easy. Well, not easy, but they were much easier than what was to come. Obi-Wan's nightmares were a daily thing, and he had to come to terms with that. But when he started to try and connect with the dead, or in other words his former master, he found little success, and without anything of substance to lock onto, he felt his hope wither away. The twins were never to be seen and he wasn't able to interact with the Lars in fear of exposing them. He had no friends, and the 180 in his quality of life derailed his mentality. Obi-Wan Kenobi was a Jedi General, one who served on the highest council in the Jedi Order, inspirational member and instructor, leader of the 7th Sky Corps, and 212. Ben Kenobi was not that man. He went from having all of his friends to no one. He went from having all of his brothers in the clone army to enemies. He had his best friend and student pulled away into the depths of the dark side, only to fall victim to his master's blade. That haunting expression in Anakin's eyes left Obi-Wan in his own personal hell, because when he looked down, all he saw were the eyes of a frightened boy whose master had failed him. Perhaps Anakin wouldn't see it that way, but Obi-Wan was a Jedi. The responsibility of a student fell onto the master. Just as Anakin felt the burden of Ahsoka's departure, Obi-Wan felt the burden of Skywalker's genocide. Kenobi went from being surrounded all the time for his entire life, aside from one year with Satine, to being secluded. He had no allies, no friends, and Owen wasn't exactly the nicest person in the galaxy. As the weeks wilted into months, time became meaningless for Obi-Wan. Not just time, but everything else. He continued to struggle to connect with the Force, and so he slowly shut himself off from it. If the Empire or Imperial sensed him, they could come for him and find the children. It'd be best if he just let his former self go and moved into his own state of mind. Naturally, considering this was his life in the first few months, it continued to worsen as the months passed into years. Kenobi's struggles were very internal, and he became a shell of himself. 
he lost his sense of self. There were moments where he could show again, but he was following Yoda's example. The time would come when a new hope would emerge. Until then, he was to stay secluded. Years passed by, his time as a Jedi nothing but a memory, and then one night, as he was eating at the mouth of his cave, he could hear noises. He almost choked on the food, but he got to his feet and looked for his binoculars. Without lights, it was hard, but he eventually found them and looked out. He could see a party of Tusken Raiders coming to the Lars homestead. Oh sure, Owen could talk trash about Obi-Wan training Anakin, but where was that energy when it came to defending Luke and Leia's grandmother? Kenobi jumped off the rocks and slammed into the ground. He shoved himself up and treaded through the sand. He was getting tired now. He had very little stamina and wasn't able to move like he was four years ago. He pushed himself as fast as he could, but he wasn't getting as far as he wanted to. He could hear the noises of the Tuscans echoing out in the night, and by the time he eventually arrived at the home, he found Owen and Brew strewn out in their front entrance, then panicked as he ran into the home skipping past bundles of fire and smoke filling the air. Kenobi hadn't used the force in forever, but he was trying to. He called out Luke and Leia's names, but there was silence. Please don't tell him they'd been killed. Please don't tell him they'd been taken away. He got to the ground and said their names again, telling them that he was a friend, he was family. There was still no sound or sight of them. He reached out his hand and used the force. It was so difficult, it had literally been four years since he cut himself off from the force. So painful. He was struggling to get anything, but he focused. He used all the training he tried to forget about, and summoned the force from within. Sweat poured from his brow from the smoke and heat and the excessive usage of the force, but then he felt it. They were here, trapped under a fallen piece of debris. Kenobi pushed through the flames and pulled the debris off their hiding place, and then pulled their arms out, picking them up and running from the burning home. When they got out, he asked if they were alright and they couldn't say a word, coughing up smoke. Obi-Wan noticed Owen and Beru, and while they weren't looking, he used all of his strength to hide their bodies back inside the home with the force. That was not a sight for four-year-olds to see. Obi-Wan would take care of the twins and eventually got them over to his abode where he would contact Bail Organa and ask that he be picked up in the morning. Tatooine was no place for these twins. Bail could tell by Obi-Wan's voice that something terrible had happened, so he immediately sent for Obi-Wan. In the meantime, Kenobi would observe the children. They were obviously distraught and likely traumatized from the event, but they were alive and alright. Neither of them were hurt physically from the attack. Obi-Wan did notice that the two of them had a natural affinity for the Force. Ben didn't say anything about it, he just silently watched and noticed how they used the Force effortlessly while they were passing a ball back and forth. He was so annoyed. Owen had been lying about them showing. Owen said that they never showed any signs. Instead, he had been telling the twins to avoid doing what they were doing. Their powers would be judged, and they'd be taken away for showing them around anyone. So the children were afraid of using the Force, but they were only using it because Kenobi explained who he was. He never said anything about being a Jedi or the Force or anything like that. He simply was their father's friend. Luke and Leia were aware that their father had been killed by being a navigator years ago. That wasn't the truth, but Kenobi needed to garner these children's trust before he revealed the reality of their father's fate. When Bail arrived, the children were in shock. The Corvette was so beautiful, and it was a piece of art. Bail would get to watch over the twins while Obi-Wan recovered his lightsabers and all of his important devices before bringing them into the vessel and telling Bail to take them to Naboo. Despite the Emperor having been born on Naboo, Obi-Wan wanted to take the twins to the other half of the family. He hoped that he could stay with the Nabiris and train the children from there. Who knows what would happen? They might outright reject him. They all told Obi-Wan he could get in touch with them before ever going there. In the following minutes, after siphoning through all of his contacts, Bail found the frequency and called. Bail was the one who spoke, saying that he wanted to come by for an important visit, asking if that would be any trouble for them. They didn't have an issue. Bail couldn't risk their transmission being intercepted, so he didn't say anything about the twins or Obi-Wan. Ben hadn't even considered that. He was coming back into touch with reality but that was hard. He was very squeamish about running into the Empire. His skill wasn't where it used to be. Four years was bad enough. He was already sore from just carrying the kids from a burning home. Regardless, Bail and Obi-Wan had time to catch up with each other before they eventually arrived at the villa. When they got there, they were greeted by Padme's parents and her older sister, Sola. They all met inside the tent of four and had a little discussion about everything. Obi-Wan introduced himself and the three already knew who he was. They were also told about the twins, and truthfully, they were all a little upset that no one had informed them. Their daughter died and they didn't get to know? What was wrong with Obi-Wan and Bail for putting them through that pain? But it was explained away as keeping them safe from the Empire. They would be prime suspects for Palpatine's search. Their response was, and the Lars weren't? 
Well, technically not. Why would the Empire go out to the Outer Rim? There was a little bit of hostility, which was entirely fair. This tension came from the fact that they spent four years grieving their daughter and the extended family they could have had, had she not perished so early into her life. Padme would have been 31 this year. The parents were able to forgive and understand why the decisions were made regarding the twins. They just wished that they were at the very least informed about them. Also, they would allow Obi-Wan to stay with them and train them. The Nabaris hated the Empire, so if they could take it down, or the Emperor, then that was a better fate for the Collective Galaxy. The reason the parents allowed Obi-Wan to stay is because he served Padme during one of her most trying times. It was him who defeated Maul on Naboo, and it was he and his master who helped unify Naboo. They had a special place in their hearts for him. Kenobi was very grateful for their welcoming, and Bell eventually left to return to Alderaan. The twins would be introduced to soulless children, Ryu and Pooja. They were a bit older, but 14 and 12 weren't too far separated. At least Luke and Leia would have a chance to grow up around other children, especially since the countryside of Naboo was filled with kids. Kenobi would also be welcomed in. Having never met Sola before, he would get the chance to socially interact with people that knew who he was and what he was. But he did ask that they refer to him as Ben. He did tell them that Ben was a nickname Satine gave him, which connected everything more for the family. They were well aware of Satine and they were quite fond of her. The first few days for everyone was a bit difficult, but slowly, it felt like the veil of light had been revealed. Luke and Leia, while burdened with the trauma of their uncle and aunt's deaths, were able to emotionally move on from the event. They did learn more about the Jedi Anakin Skywalker and the Senator Padme Amidala, which was insisted on by their grandparents. Luke and Leia were enamored with Padme's parents. They adored them, and they were grateful to be around people that knew their mother and father, because Owen and Brew never talked about them. Obi-Wan found his own peace with someone close to his age who was actually caring towards him. Sola was someone who, like Padme, was very strong-willed, but detested the political battlefield. Ben needed a friend, and now he finally had one. The Nabaris welcomed him into their home and accepted him as their own. They encouraged the training of Luke and Leia, believing that their training was necessary to them having a fuller and more complete life. After the first couple weeks went by and the three from Tatooine readjusted into life on Naboo, Kenobi would begin his first wave of instruction for the children. Luke and Leia were enrolled in a local academy so they could learn the basics. It was a simple school. But the only deal with the twins is, they weren't for sensitives and they were Luke and Leia Nabiri. Everything needed to be kept under wraps. Luckily for all the adults, Luke and Leia were wonderful children and they got the gist. Once they got acclimated to school life and being around other children, Obi-Wan would begin training with them. It wasn't anything too difficult, more so just something for them to focus on, to keep them using the force and getting used to it. Most of the time, it was basic meditation techniques, the same one used within the Jedi Temple. After a couple months, those meditation techniques became synonymous with lifting rocks and trusting the actual force. Throughout this time, Obi-Wan found himself again. It happened really quickly and he fell into it with serenity. Though this was a little different from the Obi-Wan from before, he wasn't as much of a Jedi anymore. He was loosening the reins on the code and he was feeling much more human than ever before. A lot of this came from his friendship with Sola. She really taught him how to be human again, which was a key attribute to their friendship. He wasn't just focused on training the twins, he was, but it wasn't consuming him. He found peace with what he was doing and in his mandate in life. But slowly, as the first year on Naboo went by, he found that he didn't want to train Luke and Leia. As he had with Anakin, he had with the twins. He loved them with all of his heart. Ben saw them as if they were his own children, because he saw them in such a light he didn't want anything to happen to them. He didn't want them to be responsible for his own burdens. Ben and Yoda failed, not them, so why should they be forced to pay for their mistakes? That wasn't fair or right, and that wasn't the Jedi way, especially not the Jedi Obi-Wan believed in. So, he contacted the Grand Master, hidden away on Dagobah. Yoda had a communication device, same as Obi-Wan, and the Elder Jedi Master had recently considered destroying it, but decided against it. Now he was glad he had. The two of them originally agreed that these communications weren't to be used unless absolutely necessary. Kenobi sent a small message, informing Yoda that he wanted to destroy Sidious. They needed to. The Empire was becoming too tyrannical. They should have gone back to face him after Vader's defeat on Mustafar. Obi-Wan expressed that if Yoda wasn't going to join him, that he would go alone. Yoda was left with no choice, immediately having Bail transport him from Dagobah to Naboo, where he'd finally see Obi-Wan again. The Jedi Master was much more at home with himself. There was a serene balance within the Force around Obi-Wan. 
he found his peace. Sure, he wasn't happy with how everything went, but he came to realize that those moments weren't on him. If he dwelled on them, then he'd be controlled by something that had already come and gone. Regardless, Yoda was inspired to see how much Obi-Wan had changed. There was hopelessness in his eyes when they last met, almost like he was sending himself to Tatooine to die. Now he was ready and prepared to make right of a terrible failure. The two of them were talking by a window in the villa. Luke, Leia, Raya, Pooja, and a couple other boys and girls from the local school were playing. Then told Yoda that this fight wasn't theirs. These children weren't old enough to fight in the Clone Wars. They weren't mature enough to understand the rise of the Empire. They shouldn't be held accountable for something so far out of their control. Yoda sighed. Obi-Wan was right, but they were far removed from being able to fight Sidious. So Ben told the Grand Master that they would train. They'd practice harder than ever before to defeat the Sith once and for all. Yoda could see that in his time away from Skywalker, Obi-Wan became more like his student than ever before, but he agreed. 900 years worth of information was stored inside of his mind. He could surely teach Obi-Wan how to be the Jedi he wanted to be. The training began, and it went alongside the training of Luke and Leia. Ironically, Ryo and Pooja, while not having nearly as high as a midichlorian count as Luke and Leia, joined them for their little training seminars. The meditation and melding of heart, body, mind, and ground wasn't just a Jedi practice. It was something shared between all sentients, no matter how force-sensitive they were. Sola's girls couldn't lift rocks or anything like that, but they were able to enjoy the meditation with their little brother and sister, which they considered Luke and Leia. The Jedi would start in the morning, before the kids woke up. Yoda and Kenobi would train in saber techniques, starting with one and working their way up to seven. After a brief warm-up, they'd cool down with the twins, and once the kids went to school, it was time to continue training again. This went on for the longer part of a year. By the end of that year, though, Obi-Wan was more prepared than ever before. For Yoda, not being in a swamp was also rewarding. He also found some sense of youthful energy. He still saw the execution of Order 66 as his greatest failure, but his newfound youthfulness brought him to the ground. It helped him hone in on what was important in life. Now, there were times that Vader did come to Naboo, but he was never anywhere near Padme's family estate. He simply came to visit Padme's tomb, which was beautiful, but in theme. There were whispers through the wind for both Anakin and Obi-Wan, but they selectively chose to ignore them. Vader ignoring them because the emotional burden of losing Padme was too much for him to bear, and Obi-Wan ignored it because Anakin died on Mustafar. How could he be on Naboo? The day eventually came when Ben and Yoda informed everyone they were departing. Luke and Leia had grown quite fond of Yoda. He was an adorable little green life form, one with seemingly infinite knowledge. What a fascinating creature he was. As for Obi-Wan, they viewed him as their actual father. They loved him as a father, and they did know the truth of Anakin, despite now being six years old. But Ben enforced the idea that they shouldn't hate their father, because as Obi-Wan saw it, he was corrupted. The children were all appreciative of Kenobi's openness with them, and they worried for what might come from this trip for Obi-Wan and Yoda. But Kenobi gave the twins Anakin's lightsaber and told them that when he returned, he would teach each of them how to wield one. For now, keep it on the mantle. They were in awe. They had seen it before, but it was still shiny and kept in good condition. Kenobi wrapped it back up and departed. The trip through hyperspace was quiet for the two Jedi. There were words that could be said, information that could be shared, memories that could be reminisced about, but nothing. They knew every thought the other had. This would be their moment to make a right of something they should have done six years before. When they exited above Coruscant, they could see the change already. It felt like the war hadn't left the galaxy. New destroyers littered the airspace, and new space stations stood idly outside of Coruscant. They piloted down to the surface of the planet and saw their temple. It was no longer in ruins, but it did bear the banners of the Imperial logo. What a tragedy. Their ship sped around and landed at the front of the temple, right where the clones marched in all those years before. Yoda and Obi-Wan stepped out and readied themselves, looking to each other and walking through. As they entered the temple, the colors on the inside had changed, but the darkness felt last time they were here hadn't changed. As they walked in, royal guards moved to attack and Yoda threw his hand forward, hoisting them into the rafters and releasing his grip, allowing them to fall. They stepped forward, and in front of them, a man landed, wearing black armor. He smiled and called the Jedi both by name, as an assortment of other members landed behind him. Grand Inquisitor told the two Jedi that this is what has become of their former order. To get to their Emperor, they must destroy what they created. Yoda looked at Obi-Wan and then the Grand Inquisitor. He tried reasoning with them, trying to give them a chance before they made their final mistakes, but they didn't budge. A couple of them actually wanted to join, 
but they feared Sidious more than they did Yoda. Before a battle ensued, a dark eminence appeared at the top of the stairs. Sidious's voice echoed out over the Tomb of the Jedi, and told the Inquisitors to claim victory. They all ignited their lightsabers, and the two Jedi prepared theirs as well. There was a stillness between foes. No one moved a muscle. They watched each other, and Sidious smiled above the Jedi waiting to fight amongst themselves. The Inquisitors were inexperienced compared to two masters, and they each, one by one, charged in. The two masters sped and conflict began. Kenobi and Yoda were moving between their foes and deflecting the strikes made. They were quick to disarm their opponents, trying not to kill them. But it became clear that they had no intention to give up, so the Jedi cut through them. Grand Inquisitor was the greatest of the foes, but these Jedi Masters wouldn't struggle with the likes of a former Temple Guard. Obi-Wan and Yoda used each other as guards to fend off their numerous opponents, but they soon dropped in numbers until the Grand Inquisitor was slain by Yoda's blade. The two Jedi turned towards Sidious, who hadn't moved throughout the entire battle. Obi-Wan and Yoda moved forward slowly, knowing that Sidious had his advantage with the high ground above them. Before they could confront Sidious, a crash was heard behind them, and they turned around. Sidious' voice called out, telling the Jedi to look upon their greatest failure. Kenobi felt that presence before. He wasn't imagining anything. It was actually Skywalker's essence from Naboo. Sidious introduced his champion, his apprentice, Lord Vader. Yoda looked at Obi-Wan, but he was sturdy. The Jedi Master didn't want to give the darkness an edge, even though he almost buckled. Vader's saber ignited, and Yoda told Obi-Wan that this time, they'd finished their jobs. Kenobi moved forward and faced down his former student this time preparing a new recipe to defeat him. Yoda marched up the stairs, and simultaneously, two duels began. Yoda launched himself at Sidious, and Vader did the same towards Kenobi. There was so much rage for Vader, and he prepared for the last six years to beat any opponent using Form 3. Obi-Wan noticed this immediately. Vader's strikes were perfectly aligned to counter 3, so he gave Vader a chance to bite. He continued pushing forward, and Kenobi backed up, pulling his lightsaber around and switching into Form 4, which completely derailed Vader's attacks. Sidious and Yoda were speeding against each other, their strikes fiercer and more aggressive than ever before. Unlike Yoda, Sidious had something to lose this time. The Empire was on his shoulders, his immortality was on his shoulders, if he lost here, he gave up eternal life. The two masters targeted each other with pure precision. Unlike the Senate Chambers, there was nowhere to run. While Sidious stayed inside the temple for six years, it hadn't changed in layout, and Yoda knew this layout much better due to 900 years of living here. Their blades pushed each other back, never giving their opponent a chance to counter. Kenobi and Vader had everything to their advantage, but just as he had a Mustafar, Obi-Wan realized that Vader was getting impatient. This was a waiting game. All that mattered was making sure that Vader didn't win. Kenobi blocked everything and then used Form 4 to counter every attack. Vader knew what was happening, but he couldn't land a hit. He prepared for Form 3 so much that he left out the other forms, and most of his previous opponents were not masters on the High Council. He spent the last six years pancaking Padawans and younglings, only for a real challenge to make him look like a fool. Kenobi wasn't trying to embarrass him, simply win. But this was a crushing loss for Vader already. Obi-Wan continued moving around Vader's attempts to find victory. Behind him, Yoda used the pillars to seize a high ground over Sidious. Their fight was unmatched. They were able to counter everything. Vader, on the other hand, got a little too ahead of himself and Kenobi took control bashing Vader's chess piece in, and then dominating the rest of their encounter, before eventually striking down his former apprentice. When he turned around, he could see Yoda pushing Sidious backward, and Kenobi lobbed his blade across the room. Sidious turned back to block it, which he did, and as he turned around, he threw his blade forward, only to miss Yoda and get stabbed in the chest. Sidious never anticipated that Yoda would be so bold to come back, and he paid the price for it. The two Jedi quickly scurried away from the temple, after making sure all the Sith were dead. They got to the vessel and abandoned Coruscant. The chaos that followed would be unprecedented. Luckily for the Empire, they control what was seen and what wasn't. The officers saw what Sidious was, but instead, they informed the public that the Jedi assassinated the Emperor and his closest officials. This didn't mean that these officers would have Masameda done away with. Instead of a politician upholding the position of Emperor, it'd be an Imperial officer, one close to Palpatine, and one named Tarkin. He would use his rise to power to make the hunt of the Jedi more widespread. He would also begin an era much cooler than the one prior to his ascension. Yoda and Ben returned to Naboo, and as they were landing the ship, Yoda requested that Obi-Wan leave the engines on. Kenobi was confused, but Yoda sat in his chair with a disheartened look on his face. He expressed that Vader and the Inquisitors were all his failure. He thought about it the entire trip from Coruscant. Yoda told Obi-Wan that he wasn't going to stay put. He was going to reorganize the Jedi Order on their homeworld 
which is what he should have been doing for the last six years. Obi-Wan knew Ahch Tu by name and he always wanted to visit. Yoda told Obi-Wan that he was more than welcome to come, but he denied. Ben was going to remain as Dad Kenobi. This is where he wanted to be. Luke and Leia would be safe, but if they needed to be relocated, he knew where to go. Yoda smiled, wishing that the Force would be with Obi-Wan before turning back and preparing to leave. Kenobi was quiet, like Yoda, throughout the entire trip from Coruscant. He didn't know if he should tell the twins the true fate of their father. He came to the conclusion that Vader was not Anakin. There was nothing remaining of the person he once knew. Anakin could never be so vile, so he left the death of Vader away from their knowledge. Instead, he walked out of the ship and he was greeted by hugs from Luke and Leia. They were both so happy to see that Ben survived. He told them about Coruscant and how one day he would like to take them there, but for now, it'd be best that they stay here and enjoy the sanctuary of Naboo. The kids waved to Yoda, not really understanding why he was leaving, but he flew off, out to find other Jedi in the galaxy. There were less than a hundred, and he had every intention of restarting the Jedi Order. He would save those lost and prepare them for the rebuilding of this new order. One day, hopefully, Luke and Leia had become members, and hopefully, Kenobi would fill the role of Grand Master. On Nebu, Obi-Wan and his friend Sola would get to raise two separate pairs of children together. Sola never wanted a relationship, which is why both of her daughters were donor produced, but she, having had the experience with being a parent, was more than willing to be a help for Obi-Wan. Kenobi found so much of himself again through raising Luke and Leia. He continued training and being a Jedi, but Padme's father got Obi-Wan a job, so he could eventually save up and buy his own plot. Kenobi would work in a local construction to help the town keep everything together. It kept them spry and ready than ever if anything came. Ben settled into a habit. The days therefore blurred together. But as he made a habit out of his life, he learned to not let life pass him by. It was so easy, especially with two children, to be consumed by the time that could fly by him. But he learned to enjoy every moment, even the bad ones. There were times when the twins drove him crazy, but he did everything he could to make sure their adolescence was pure joy. They had a bundle of trauma to move past, and with their dad Kenobi, they were able to hurdle each obstacle. He took them to live music performances, on shopping halls, boat rides in the lake nearby, and camping trips up the mountains. Ben enjoyed it, and despite his motivation being to make their lives as normal as possible, he ended up making his own life normal. He also realized that through this process, he was healing his own demons. Sometimes he'd be plagued with the fear of what would have been if he never left Tatooine. These thoughts kept him up at night, but he moved around them, and understood he would never have to worry about it because this wasn't that. The twins grew up before his eyes, and they were so fond of their dear old dad. Initially, the twins referred to him as Ben, then they called him Dad Kenobi, and finally he was just referred to as Dad, nothing less, because to them, this was their family, Obi-Wan, the Nibiris, and Yoda. It was their big happy family. There are very little issues from the Empire out here. Of course, the Empire would come, but Ben had become such a staple in their community that he wasn't a Jedi, he was just Ben Kenobi the construction guy. The Empire never thought anything about it, considering he wasn't the only Kenobi in the galaxy. Ben's little brother lived on Stujan, so they knew that Obi-Wan still had to be out there somewhere. Aside from that, they were untouched by the Empire, and it was a free life. Kenobi eventually saved up for a starship and used it to take the kids across the stars. They wanted adventure, so he gave them adventure. Obviously in moderation, he knew what Skywalkers could be like. During their journeys, they'd find themselves Ahsoka, she was aiding Organa in setting up a rebellion, and truthfully, she couldn't have been more overjoyed. Initially, she thought that Luke and Leia were biologically his, based on their quick quips and their snarky attitude. This for them wasn't misbehaving, but just being well socialized. Ahsoka was such a joy for Obi-Wan to see, and he asked if she would like to come along with, but she denied, having found her calling for the moment but she couldn't really articulate how happy she was for the trio. Ben would make up fun little quests for the twins, especially for their summer vacations. He'd teach them how to fly without scaring gray hairs into his head, and how to be a Jedi. It was a great combo. As they continued growing up, they spoke about the Empire and the Rising Rebellion. At this point, they were 14, and Obi-Wan didn't want to tell them that they couldn't go and fight, but he also told them that the Rebels would win before they could fight. Tarkin's tyranny caved the system in on itself, and it caused loyal worlds to rebel. It forced them to feel betrayed by their government. People speaking out were dying, and it was becoming more and more obvious that if the people didn't rally together, they'd become victims too. Kenobi told the children to not worry about it. At this point, Luke and Leia had no reason to concern themselves with it, 
They were in secondary school, and it was their time for sports, to enjoy life to grow up. It was unfair, but who cares? They were star athletes and enjoying being kids. Why stop them because they're force sensitive? Luke played Ross, which was a game with a bunch of players on the field, each held a stick, and they threw a ball with the stick. Leia played ball foot, which is pretty self-explanatory. Kenobi would be able to see all of them off to the big dances and watch the twins grow up. It was perfect, but a part of him longed for his own connection, so Sola introduced him to a couple of her friends, one of which being named Darme Thons, and that would be the one Ben would have the joy of falling in love with for the next couple of years, meaning Luke and Leia finally got themselves a real mother. Outside of the joyful life of Naboo, Yoda had saved two dozen former Jedi, sending or bringing them individually to Octu himself, the youngest, technically, being Grogu and the eldest being Yoda's good friend, Tara Sanube. With Professor Hyang present as well, they had the building blocks for their own new Jedi Order. And the best part about Octu is, it was completely protected from the Empire. Only Jedi knew where it was, and it would be here where the twins could finally see their goofy old Uncle Yoda once more. His change of heart and his new outlook on life helped Yoda find peace within himself. They also were incredibly impressed with the beginning of this new order. There may have been 24 Jedi, but they were all harmonizing, they were all becoming one, and the twins expressed a desire to become Jedi one day, and Obi-Wan promised them that they would be. The war between the Empire and the Alliance would fiddle out into a rebel victory. The people turned against the Empire, its Senate, and its leader. The collective people understood and saw what was going on around them. A smart population is one that cannot be controlled. Sidious understood this. Tarkin learned it too late. The restructuring of democracy would parallel the rebirth of the Jedi Order. It wouldn't be seen or spoken about, but it would exist, and it would, with the guidance of Yoda and Ben, see a new era where Jedi could have relationships. There are many things the Jedi of old got correct, and it was here on Octu where the beginning of the past could be reflected in the beginning of the present. And that, my friends, is our wholesome PP and Grand Tier story. Special thanks to all of our patrons, Bedroom Wells, Jenga Fett Clone, Ben Ingram, The Big Red Pure Mark, Diamond Constant, Darth Nemesis, Lord Tib, CC2024, Galavan Gaming, Tristan, Mandalore, Sir Wellum, 1767, Darth Revan, Grandy Bane, Laliant, Sky Guy, Penguin, Cullen Rooney, Shark Midori, RJ38, Nick, Michael Erlanger, The Last Jedi, Apollo Wee with 67, Annika Stank Runner, CT7567, Toaster Oven, Oz of Oz, Darth Knox, The Eternal Padawan, Joshua Town, Johnny Daguin, Santa Skeleton, Jedi Sloth, Mr. E Gamer, Lord Cali, Youngly Slayer 66, Mad Mad Studios, Anakin 003, Lord Draken, Fortis Legacy Star Wars, Erebus, Rex the Wolf, The Man Three First Names, Dark C46, Baron Joshua, and Lord Deadwing for supporting the channel. Smash that like button, support me in other ways, go check out the Patreon, super cool things on there. Otherwise, let's talk about this story. I wanted the twins to be in the same predicament as they are in, in canon, where they're raised by someone that's not a force wielder, and I wanted to show kind of a darker side to Owen in this, but once he's gone, I thought the idea of bringing the twins to Nabu would be very interesting. I also didn't want to do a large time gap of 20 years so that Luke and Leia could be trained from birth type of thing. I feel like that's kind of overdone, and I wanted Obi-Wan and Yoda to kind of correct their own wrongings, the theme of this video is more of it's their burden, not Luke and Leia's. So Luke and Leia can actually be like the heroes of their own Jedi Order once they're full adults and, and be what Jedi are supposed to be at the end of the day. So I love you all, spread the love, and always remember my friends, may the Force be with you.